love as an absolute state of being to which, if one were lucky, one might find access. In his maturity, he had decided it was the heaven of a false religion toward which one ought to gaze in an amused disbelief, a gently familiar contempt, and an embarrassed nostalgia. Now, in his middle age, he began to know that it was neither a state of grace nor an illusion. He saw it as a human act of becoming, a condition that was invented and modified moment by moment and day by day by the will and the intelligence and the heart. That's beautiful. That's the best description that I've found to describe the way that I conceive of love, mm. that we carry around all these illusions about it. And what it really is, is something that we build. And it's hard. It's beautiful, but it's also work. Yeah. So we have a letter and it happens to be, you know, really kind of hits on these notes that we're talking about. Dear Sugar, I just turned 50, have two children in college, and I've been married for 25 years. I have a job I love. I live in a nice house in a nice neighborhood, and I have my health minus a few new middle-aged quirks. So what's my problem? Well, I wonder if I would have ever known I was living on autopilot if not for a phone call two years ago from my high school boyfriend, who was my first everything. Is an emotional affair a real thing? We do not live near each other, but we've texted and called every day. We did manage to see each other about five times over the six months we were in contact. No sex, though. Honest. I can't express the happiness I felt or the feelings of desire. I had forgotten what that was like. It ended when his wife found the texts on his phone. It took me a long time to get over it. My husband is a great guy, but I'm not attracted to him, and I haven't been for an extremely long time. It's like living with a friend. But I love our life together with friends and family. I understand why people stay together for the kids. As a family, we have great trips and holidays, and I like that my kids have a home base. I can't imagine hurting them. So maybe that's life. You can't have it all. Being a grown-up means you make the best of the road you chose, right? Signed, Muddled in the Midwest. Wow. Steve, what do you think? 25 years married, gets a phone call from the high school boyfriend. Yeah. She says, is an emotional affair a real thing? Oh, yes. Hello, baby. Hello. That's the most real. <laughs> it's a, a sense, real thing. Yeah, it's a real thing. And the real betrayal and the real moment that she's kind of turned away from her marriage is not sex. It's that she's really confiding in and expressing her deepest self and telling the story of her life to this other person. What's important and what she needs to listen to is she needs attention. Love begins and ends with attention. When you pay attention to something that is the first and final form of love, and she's seeking it out from this guy who obviously is not finding it in his marriage. That's how these things start. You can feel somebody who's in her 50s, you know, no longer has the deep feeling of being a mom and being absorbed with that, which can basically put on hold the desires that we have for that kind of deep communion with another person, romantic communion. And she does not have it in the context of her marriage. And so along comes Mr. High School Sweetheart and all of those feelings of when love is new and fresh and everything is the first time, understandably, are going to kind of explode within her. I totally get that. But the reality is that's not a real relationship. He's mm -hmm. married to somebody else. And he decided to cut off contact with her. Exactly. Once this he got caught. affair was revealed. Right. But what is real is that she is left with that residue of those longings. You know, one thing that I think is in favor of her perhaps trying with her husband is she loves him. She yeah. thinks he's a great guy. They have a happy life together. This is a very different story than... You know, he's a schmuck, he doesn't care about me, you know. I mean, there would be all these good reasons to say, well, maybe this next chapter of your life doesn't include him, you know, for, for good reasons. One of the fascinating things to me about this letter is she doesn't say to us, well, you know, should I try to reinvigorate my marriage? She says, should I just continue in my marriage as it is? Yeah. You know, and, and I would say clearly what this ex-boyfriend did is he awakened That's her, right. You know, which is a really... We need to be woken up every couple of decades. We really do. And maybe more frequently. Maybe more frequently, but a, a big, like a really big awakening every right. couple of decades. You know, her kids now are off, they're adults. This is a new era. And so you do need to take stock and say, well, where do I go from here? One of the unfortunate things about divorce is like we do see it as a failure. 
a couple's been married 25 years and they decided to divorce. Was it a failure? Mm -hmm. You know, I think the answer is, you know, no, you, you were together all those years and, and you probably made a lot of good things right. in those 25 years. I mean, the failure is, it only resides in if you gave up without trying, if you gave did up. you do the work? Or you settled and stayed in it without consciousness. And I think that actually there are versions of the same thing. This woman faces a crossroads. Can she and her husband reinvigorate that love? Can they start the fire again? And the answer isn't necessarily yes, but I think it would be even worse in a way to not try. Yeah. I think the kids, I mean, it's not to say I'm not concerned about them, but the central question here is not will the kids be all right, but what do I want? Now, you know, what if she does go to him with this honesty, with this vulnerability? And, you know, I would encourage that. You know, I do think if you're questioning your life on this level, if you're questioning the meaning of your marriage, the future of your marriage on this level, you do need to bring it all the way down to the bones and say, sweetie, you know, something hard is in store for us because I have to tell you, I sort of fell back in love with this ex-boyfriend. I didn't have sex with him, but I did fall for him and I felt lust for him and, and we didn't act on it and it's over. And I either need to leave you to start anew, and I don't want to do that because I love and treasure our life that we've built together, but I want more. You know, we have to have some of that passion back. Mm -hmm. And here's the other thing. If we talk to her husband, he would probably report the same thing that she does. Of course. He would probably say, I love my wife. I love our kids. I love our and house. Not, and our there's not a great and, passion. And we don't have this passion. And I mean, it's kind of like that song. If you like pina coladas and making love in the rain, if you <laughs> oh, like champagne. Oh, oh it's Is like, it like that, that song. Yeah. And if you like making love after midnight, you know that song? I you unfortunately know song. do. They, both yeah. these people, they're in a couple, right? Yes. They place ads. They're looking for somebody who wants all these things. Yeah. They, in they search want of the same pina coladas. Things. And they show up at this restaurant to drink pina coladas. And who is there? Who is there? but the person they're already with. But it's, it's profound. You know, you think that what you want is elsewhere and what you want is actually the thing you've been living with for the last 25 years. But here's the thing, is that in this case, I think that muddled in the Midwest, you're going to have to resolve yourself to the idea that there's never going to be a first love. There's never going to be that excitement of high school. There's never even going to be the excitement of the illicit affair that doesn't have any consequences and isn't even a real relationship. Mm -hmm. You have made a big, complicated life with your husband. And in the course of that, somehow you guys have both fallen away from a deep, passionate engagement that you desperately need, or at least that you want very much. And now you have to be able to say to your husband, I want this thing that we used to have. It's great. You're a great guy. I love being your friend, but I want to be your lover. Yeah. And I don't need pina coladas, and I don't need it, the love making to be in the rain. I get it. We're 50. We've got a big, complicated life, but I do want some of that back, and I deserve it, and also you deserve it. So let's see if we can figure out a way to not start a big, blazing brush fire of lust and so forth, but actually within the context of this life, just build a little fire muddled in the Midwest has a lot to think about. What this question is about is like, what is this next era of your life going to look like? Yeah. And any way you cut it, it involves communicating with her husband about that, yeah. you know, that he's either part of the remaking of their marriage, the reinvigoration, or he's part of the saying goodbye to it with some yeah. grace. Yeah, and it's tough because it's going to be a change. But sometimes the fire is lit within you and you're reawakened and then you know, uh-oh, something's going to have to change. I hope, I hope, I hope it's for the better. Whether yes. she's with her husband, whether muddled in the Midwest, you go off and, you know, find another love. I hope it's a happy, it's a happy ending. A year or two after Brian and I got married, I was at graduate school in Syracuse, at Syracuse University, getting my MFA. And we were living there, and, and, and we were having some sort of argument in the kitchen. And Sounds plausible. And I said to him, I'm going to be mad at you for the rest of my life. Yes. And he said, oh, 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 hold on. Let me write that down. And he got a piece of paper, and he wrote down, 
<laughs> I'm going to be mad at you for the rest of my life. And he put quotation marks around it and then wrote Cheryl Strayed. And then he, we had this uh, clear magnet on our refrigerator that you, you had like a photo inside. Yeah. And he pulls the photo out and he puts that piece of sure. paper um, inside this clear magnet and put it on our refrigerator. Yeah. And of course, what happened is we both just started laughing you yeah. know, so hard. <laughs> and that magnet, it, we lost it, I think, in our most recent move. But that magnet was on our refrigerator for years. Right. I'm going to be mad at you for the rest of my life, signed Cheryl Strayed. And, you know, people would come to our house for parties and stuff, and they'd be like, what is this? And, you know, we'd explain, well, it's a quote from, right. this is what Cheryl said to Brian. People yeah, would be like, she's a writer. What a mean? terrible thing to say, <laughs> right. you know, and we would laugh. And I mean, obviously it's preposterous uh, that I say I'm going to be mad at him the rest of my life. There's also something true about it. Yeah. There's also something true about it. Yeah. Which is really kind of interesting to me that there's absolutely no way that you can love someone as sort of profoundly and deeply and daily and like all of those ways that you you are asked to love someone in the course of a marriage without also having a lot of rage exactly. and, you know, hardship and a sense right. of turmoil, like you again, why you? And, you yes. know, I, I, you, know you, you project all of your worst parts onto that person and your best. And, and so, you know, I think it's like you do need to choose well when it comes to who are you going to do that dance with? That's right. Because you are going to be mad at them for the, for the rest, rest of, of your life. life. Yeah. And, and if it goes well, you're also going to love them. You know, it's yeah. the beauty and the, and the burden of long-term commitment or marriage, you know, whatever form that takes. Speaking of that burden and commitment and beauty, and I would rage, like, yeah. I would, and rage and love, I'd love to call Brian. We must. Hello. Now listen, Brian, before Cheryl even gets a crack at you, I want to, I want to ask you this question. I want you to be honest with me because we're on Dear Sugar Radio. All right. Will you be my Valentine? <laughs> <laughs> I am your Valentine. I knew ah, it. I knew no, it. No, I was shaking my head. No, Brian, I can't believe you betrayed me. I'm going to turn him, Cheryl. With my I'm going to turn him. spouse. <laughs> Brian, I just told them the story about, remember when we were fighting and I said, I'm going to be mad at you for the rest of my life. <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is I, it, it turns out to true. be true. It's just, That's right. <laughs> It's true. And yet I'm also fiercely, ferociously, madly, eternally in love with you. Oh. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Should we tell the story of how we met? You know, it, we actually fell in love in a rather backwards fashion, didn't we? But we did. <laughs> so we met in the doorway of a Mexican restaurant. I had just finished my PCT hike and I had 20 cents to my name. And so I had a yard sale and I sold a bunch of my stuff. And I met this super handsome guy who bought a pencil sharpener in the shape of an airplane from me. Um, and he invited me to, to dinner that night. It wasn't Brian. Um, it was, <laughs> <laughs> I was already, <laughs> it was our friend Tom and he was going to dinner uh, at this Tex-Mex place with his friend, Brian. And so I, I went and, you know, I was punctual and waiting and I was with a friend and these guys weren't showing up. And I was like, I'm not going to wait around. So I drank a margarita and uh, my friend and I got up and we left and we were walking out the door and. And we were walking in the door and unbeknownst to me, Tom had told Cheryl that we were having dinner like at eight o'clock. And so we come sauntering into the restaurant at 830. So I, I came, you know, moments away from not getting to meet her. You know, he was really intrigued by this hike I'd just been on. And, you know, we had this kind of um, conversation that got deeper as the night went on. And I think my exact words were, you have to write about that someday. Oh, my God. Yes, yeah, it's true. Brian, from the very <laughs> first day he met me, and I kept saying, no, no, there's no story in it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the night, Brian wrote down his name and his phone number on a little scrap of paper. And I, you know, took it into my room. I had this little futon on the floor of this little house that I was just renting a room. And um, I put his number on the windowsill and I didn't call him and he didn't call me. And a couple of weeks passed and I went into my room one night and I lit a candle and there was this little gust of wind that came through the little cracked window and it blew this piece of paper and it blew it straight into the candle that I had just lit. Yes. And it lit on fire. This is a true story. It lit on fire and burned up in the air. I thought this is a sign 
you know, <laughs> many people would say this was a sign never to contact this man. Mm -hmm. I thought this is fine. I should call him. So I looked him up in the phone book. This was 1995. It was back in the days, boys and girls. So we went out to dinner and you know, one of the things that we immediately recognized about each other is we came from the same place and we traveled the same distance. We were both artists who came from working class backgrounds. You know, his mother was a single mom for a big time of her life. My mother was. And we just clicked in that way. The other thing we had in common is that we were both kind of don't go loving me, babe. And so we did what we always did when we met other people and we immediately slept together. <laughs> Which I remember, do you remember what I, I asked you the, the morning when we woke up after that night? We, I hate to say it, I don't remember. Oh. Oh. I said, do you regret this? And you, Oh, that's right. You did ask me that. You said no. And I said, no. You asked me if I regret it. I said, no, but I lied. I did regret it because, you know, I'd reached this point in my life where I wasn't interested in that anymore. I'd learned what I needed to learn from promiscuity. And I didn't know then that you were also at that same place in your life. And, you know, we very soon after that had a conversation that, you know, I basically said, I don't want to see you anymore because I think, you know, you're a player and I want something different. And Brian said, okay, actually, let's just be friends. And so then what happened, Brian? Can you fill in this part of the story for us? And so we had this kind of magical, uh, was it three weeks? Was it six? I, I don't know. But it was just like this kind of magical getting to know each other period that um, was just so kind of revealing and, and and bonding. I just, you know, really couldn't believe how exciting it was to kind of get to spend time with you. Aww. And, you know, all this was done with kind of this idea of, okay, we're not going to have sex. We're not going to be romantic. We're just going to get to know each other. And we didn't. We didn't touch each other. You know, for more than a month, we just became friends and we fell madly in love with each other. And by the end of that, it was really interesting. There was finally just a breaking point where I just couldn't help myself. And I reached out to Brian and he took my hands and we were just in love with each other. Wow. I revoke my request to be Brian's Valentine. Like, I'm not getting in the middle of this. <laughs> you know, I, I think um, if I had to say one word that... Um, you know, bound Cheryl and I together, it would be story. And not just that we had similar stories, but also a, um, a kind of reverence for the power of story. Right. These origin stories are, are so important because they remind us and, and they inspire us and they, they get us through some rough patches. And maybe that's the beauty of Valentine's Day, is that, you know, it gives us a chance to kind of revisit and affirm and move forward. Amen. Amen. Something about what happens when we talk. I want to read you one of my favorite poems of all time. It's by Margaret Atwood, mm -hmm. you know, world famous fiction writer. Yeah. But it turns out she's also a great poet, also a great short story writer. This poem is called Habitation. Mm -hmm. Marriage is not a house or even a tent. It is before that and colder. The edge of the forest, the edge of the desert, the unpainted stairs at the back where we squat outside eating popcorn. We're painfully and with wonder at having survived even this far we are learning to make fire. Wow. Have you ever heard that before? I've never heard that before. Isn't it great? It's so beautiful. Now, this is the oldest story. We're just trying to figure out how to rub two sticks together and make fire. Yeah. We're learning to make fire. And, and maybe if we forget that we're doing that, if we forget to make the fire, that's when love dies. You know? <laughs> it's funny. It put me in mind of this poem that I really love that's a really cranky love poem, but it's also about sort of love as a habitat, and I want to read it to you. It's by Alan Dugan. Nothing is plumb, level, or square. The studs are bowed. The jousts are shaky by nature. No piece fits any other piece without a gap or pinch, and bent nails dance all over the surfacing like maggots. By Christ, I am no carpenter. 
I built the roof for myself, the walls for myself, the floors for myself, and got hung up in it myself. I danced with a purple thumb at this housewarming, drunk with my prime whiskey, rage. Oh, I spat rage's nails into the frame-up of my work. It held. It settled plumb, level, solid, square, and true for that great moment. Then it screamed and went on through, skewing as wrong the other way. God damned it. This is hell, but I planned it. I sawed it, I nailed it, and I will live in it until it kills me. I can nail my left palm to the left hand cross piece, but I can't do everything myself. I need a hand to nail the right, a help, a love, a you, a wife. <laughs> I said it was cranky, but it's it is so cranky. beautiful. <laughs> and that's, I mean, this it's is beautiful. terrible, but that is sometimes how I feel. I am no carpenter. The life I'm trying to make, the house I'm trying to make, the family I'm trying to make, nothing seems to fit sometimes. <laughs> and it's all my fault. But what I love is how it ends. You know, if we're going to be real about love, what matters isn't that the house is off balance and you built it and you screwed it up, but do you have somebody there with you? And that is why I'm so thankful that I have Aaron in my life. It is Valentine's Day. Yes, it is. Why don't we call Aaron? We should do that. Hello. Hi, sweetie. Hi. Hi, Erin. How are you? I'm good, Cheryl. How are you? I'm great. I've been in the company of your very sweet husband on this Valentine's Day. Yeah, and in fact, asking the question, should love just naturally click versus, you know, a love that is more of a struggle? And, and I think of our relationship, sweetie, as having been a struggle. It's been a struggle for both of us. Would you agree with that? I would, but I also feel like that we had, in terms of clicking, like we always had a certain chemistry between us that was undeniable. Yes. And there was a lot of like extraneous stuff. Like we come from different kinds of families or in different places in our lives. Like pretty important big stuff. But like when we were in a room together, I felt like there was a pretty undeniable connection. So that was never in question for me. Like, I never felt like I had to work at that. It was sort of all the other stuff. Like, okay, is, is that connection worth working through all of that other stuff that will have to be worked through? Well, we met at a time that I don't think you were really ready for a long-term committed relationship heading towards family. And even though I told myself, well, that's what I want and so forth, right. I wasn't really ready for it either. Right. I mean, I think when I think of our courtship sometimes, like we created kind of in a, a scenario where we were having an affair with each other, but neither one of us was attached to anyone else. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> right. we kind of had this secret relationship that was very tumultuous and we didn't meet each other's families and we were very on and off, but we would have these like really, you know, wonderful, passionate stretches of time where it was like these little moments that were sort of out of our lives. Like we're going to have this weekend and it's going to be totally decadent. And then we're going to kind of pack up our stuff and go back and lead our everyday lives. Let's back up here. Why was your relationship yeah. kind of secret? I don't understand. Well, because we sort of worked publicly together, but we moved in the same circles. But why didn't you want other people to know you were together? Because we weren't really together. You, you were kind of in this on and off, like... No strings attached. Yeah, I mean, that's funny because I think it was the relationship that we both wanted even though I kept saying, like, why won't you be my boyfriend? I want you to be my boyfriend. The truth is, if I wanted a boyfriend, I would have gone and found one. But I wanted you, and, and I think you did too. You, you know, you would say, I can't be with you because I'm ready to get married and have kids. But, <laughs> but you weren't making that happen either, you know what I mean? Oh, For yeah, a while. that's right. I would go on dates with women who I thought were sort of at that place in their lives where they were ready for right. that. And I just didn't feel anything. And so. Right. Know, and I, and I would go on dates with guys who are like, yes, I'm looking for a girlfriend. And, and I would think, oh, when am I going to see Steve again? You know, how long did this go on? This kind of. Oh my God. No how long did it go it on went on to... for years, actually. It yeah. did. It went on for a couple of years. Oh, and then I went away couple. to grad school. And, and that's when we got serious. <laughs> we had a very sudden acceleration then. I mean, really sudden into well, honey, remember how it played out? I knew that at a certain point I wanted to propose to Aaron, 
And so I carried around this this ring. I had this beautiful antique ring that my mom had given to me. And, right. and I went out to visit her over a Christmas break in her second year at, at Irvine. And I had this ring and I was like waiting for the right romantic moment. But as usual, I just completely screwed it up. And I, and we got into this conversation and I'm, I got this ring in my backpack, burning a hole in my backpack. Aaron was talking about getting a job the next year teaching at Irvine or doing something in Southern California. I was like, well, aren't you coming back to Boston? She looked at me and like, I'm not coming back to Boston in, unless we get married. And I looked at her and said, well, I'm not going to get married to you until you propose to me. And she said, I'm not going to propose to you unless you have a ring. And I said, well, what makes you think I don't have a ring? And she said, fine, will you marry me? And I said, well, I don't know. I have to think about it. And I ran into the other room and I got the ring and I gave it to her. That is so sweet. And, and it also speaks to the deep and profound nature of your love that, I mean, with no offense to our beloved WBUR in Boston, that she's willing to move from sunny, warm California to the very oh. snow-encased Boston <sighs> yes. for, for your love. It speaks well, volumes. You, you, need, you, need to right he, you need to hear what happened over the next few days, Cheryl, because we get engaged, <laughs> right? And then we have to, we just have to tell you the way this played out here. So, I, you know, so we have this wonderful moment where we're now engaged. Steve gets on the plane the next day, goes back to Boston. A few days later, I have this very odd period. And I'm thinking, no effing way, man. (laughs) That's not in the plan. (laughs) So we've basically gone from the extremes, right? From the like affair, like on and off, very turbulent relationship to like, I'm pregnant and we got to buy a house and I got to move across the country and all of the stuff that we had to right. suddenly figure out and manage. And, and also our relationship, because oh. we'd never lived together before we were suddenly not just living together, married, but living together like with me super pregnant and then with a little baby in the house. Here's the thing I want to say. is like if you could have possibly mapped out the bad ways to go about things, I, <laughs> I think I mostly managed, and fate, of course, mostly managed to just engineer the worst possible, like the manual for how to not court a woman, propose <laughs> to her, impregnate uh. her. And, and and yet, sweetie, I feel like despite all of that, despite stumbling around and not having the proper conversations and being intentional enough and so forth, I feel like in the crucial moments, we have really, you know, pulled together when we've needed to and gotten it together. And ours is not an easy, convenient love. It's been work. It's more about, you know, what you do in the face of these situations, that that's what right. really matters. And whether we're willing to do the work together, I'm not like great, but I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. But the beauty of at least the way that John Williams and Stoner is talking about love is it is something that isn't faded. It is created and created moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. It's something that is continually in process. And you have been so patient with me and such a blessing in my life. I love you so much, sweetie. Thank you, sweetie. I love you too. Mm, Happy Valentine's Day, you little lovebirds. No navigation system beyond our eyes watching well steve we have another question about love on this valentine's day episode love. i'll read the letter dear sugar i'm a 28 year old gay girl who has spent most of the last seven years in a relationship with a girl i love more than i can say with words she's from a conservative christian background as am i and has deeply embedded shame and guilt for being in a relationship with a woman. And because of that, she has never really embraced her sexual identity. Our relationship has always suffered because of this. As she hides this part of herself, she also hides me. Hmm. She never wants to talk about a commitment with me because it would also mean a commitment to being gay. Recently, she cheated on me for the second time in our relationship. The first time was a one-time thing after which she begged for forgiveness, promising to change. I forgave her. This time was a more extended affair. It hurts exponentially more. I'm stunned and angry and would rather not get out of bed most days. I broke it off after I found out about the affair, and now it's like she's truly seeing me for the first time and realizing what she's thrown away. 
She is once again promising to change, to finally be all in on our relationship. She says she's working to learn to love and accept herself completely. During our relationship, I had moved to her hometown and built my life around her. A big part of me just wants to move far away now and have a fresh start. I've always wanted to move away from the Midwest to the West Coast. I want to believe that I could find someone who would be proud to be with me, love me completely, and see a future with me. It's just near impossible to picture being happy with someone who isn't her, as this was my first relationship. Should I stay and wait and hope that she does change and then give her another chance? If I go, is that giving up? Is loving her enough of a reason to stay? Signed, stay or go. What do you think? Is there something else out there? I mean, I don't mean to be dismissive, but it's like, it's your first love. Yeah. Trust me, there'll be more. If that's your destiny, there'll be plenty more. Yeah, that was, I mean, there are so many things beneath their issues here. But, you know, so often in these letters we read, there's like one sentence that sort of sticks out to me, like mm -hmm. the, the shining bright star sentence. And for me, it, it honestly was, you know, this expressed fear that nobody will ever love me yeah. again the way this woman does. And I think we almost always feel that way when we're in a relationship. And we really feel that way um, when we're in our first love relationship. And when we've been betrayed. Yeah. This woman has made her feel quite insecure by betraying her twice. Right. One of the dynamics, I think, of being cheated on, I've been both the cheater and cheated on. Many of us, by the time you know we've lived a long life, right, we've been on both sides of that. Have you mm -hmm. been on both sides of that I've equation? I've been on both sides of that equation. I mean, they both suck. Yes. And, but you have a different kind of power when you are the one who cheated. I do believe that, you know, relationships can absolutely survive mm -hmm. these kinds of betrayals and infidelities. That's not a deal killer for me. And I don't think that that's the reason that this couple should break up. I don't know what this couple should do, but I will say that to me, you know, obviously she's responding in pain to these infidelities. But what I'm hearing more is that she's feeling constrained by this relationship. Absolutely. You know, that she's, is, yeah. she needs to go right. and find her life. As she says, as she hides this part of herself, she also hides me. And sometimes what relationships become is a place where you can hide. Yeah. She wants to leave the Midwest. She wants to have a bigger life. She feels her girlfriend is hiding her, but really, in a sense, she's hiding as well. Yeah. So we have a couple of guests. We have a couple of guests here in Mississippi studios with us to talk about this. Cameron Esposito and Rhea Butcher, they are both brilliant stand-up comics. And I want to mention that Cameron is the author of a forthcoming book, which she will soon write, and then it will be published by Grand Central <laughs> Publishing, called How to Be a Lesbian. Which is a book I want to read. I've already written that. How to Be an Erotic Jewish Guy. That market was taken. <laughs> and so Cameron now has got the corner on I already the... wrote the book How to Be a Slut in the 90s. Right. right. So let's, right. let's learn how to I how love that do title more lesbian. than wild, but they chose wild. What are you going to do? It's a marketing <laughs> I, people. I, I, what I are you going to do? The, the second title was How to Be a Slut in the 90s. Yeah. But, a lot of Doc Martens. Am I right? That's right. <laughs> I, had, I had read Doc Martens. Are I'm, you, yeah, I'm you guys, sure you did. Yeah. There's no you know chance did. you didn't. Those cherry red ones. So... So... Cameron, Rhea, what in this letter speaks to you? Well, I guess I'll start. This is Cameron. We have beautiful female voices that sometimes people say they can't determine which is which speaking, and that's <laughs> ridiculous. You just need to listen to more women talk out of their mouths. But uh, <laughs> Rhea and I are not only hilarious stand-up comics, but we're also in a relationship. And I will say that I really felt for the writer of this letter in so many ways. Um, the first thing that stuck out to me, because Cheryl, you said there's like that one sentence. And for me, it was... Um, saying that uh, her partner was not comfortable with her sexual identity. It's not your sexual identity. Being gay is not your sexual identity. Right. It is your identity. identity. Yep. You know, sometimes people will ask me, like, why do you talk about being a lesbian in your stand-up? And I want to say, because I literally what other viewpoint would I take? I don't know any other vantage point. I was raised very conservative Catholic family. I came out when I was 20. My dad cried for five years mm. because he was really worried about me going to hell. He thought I would never be able to have a partner or a family. You know, my parents didn't know any gay people that were functional and right. happy. Right. They just had no exposure to it. And right. so when I came out, it wasn't that they hated me. They were just so worried for me because they had no models to look to. That's right. And, um, you know, when Doma was overturned, my dad is the first person that called Rhea and I. So there is an opportunity for change. That's the first thing I would say. 
But I just, I think that her partner has conveyed to her for so long and so strongly that like my sexual identity is something I'm struggling with. No, this is your whole thing. Right. There is nothing less important it's who you are. and more important yeah. to the rest of your life. Does that mean when you hear that this woman's partner is, you know, still in the closet and feels very uncomfortable with her identity, for you, would you say that's bad news? And, and not, I'm going to abandon you, but you need to get straight with yourself before we can be in a relationship together? Rhea, take this one. Oh, thank you. Yes. I had like a tear coming out myself. You know, like I, I mean, I your knew. leg was out, yeah. then your arm. Yeah, and then my arm, and then I was like, oh, nope, elbows back in. Right. Um, but like I knew I was gay since I knew I was a human being. You know, like I just knew it, didn't know what the words were to describe that because right. I'm from Ohio. Um, just like I like to call it the thinking man's Indiana. Um, <laughs> So there, I just didn't see, like Cameron was saying, I just didn't see a lot of gay people. And then I grew up in a Catholic education environment, not being raised Catholic myself. But but they got plenty of that shame and guilt right yeah, in there. They just, All right. It was not a thing that anybody ever talked about. And I came out as a teenager uh, around 18 to a friend who then I ended up dating this guy because he was like, well, I'm... And He's so like, then, I'm turned on by lots of fans. Yeah, because yeah. I felt sorry for him. Because yeah. Catholic guilt. And you know? maybe maybe <laughs> wow. also because we hide in relationships sometimes. That's exactly. fascinating. Yes. I just want to add that I think there's also a special thing for your first relationship as a gay person because it's almost a familial relationship where yes. you're coming out and you're going through that together. Even yeah. if her partner's, you know, half out or quarter out or mm -hmm. 10% out, they're navigating this new world and it becomes this... I mean, I had a very intense time extricating myself from my first love <laughs> because it wasn't just my first love, she was also the only person I trusted with all these new details That's about right. myself. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I treated her badly, not leaving that relationship when I knew I needed to leave because I needed her around, you know, to love me as right. like a mother and a sister and a friend yeah, and sure. all those things that I right. was feeling distanced from. And then you think about these two women are both on a kind of island. Yeah. You know, it's, it's clear that they don't have the kind of support from their families and every relationship can feel like that even a long marriage can feel like an island but in this case it's literally that's your family because mm -hmm. that's the only person who knows your true identity even if it's a guy at least he knew Rhea your true identity which made him in some ways more intimate with you than your family and I also would just say when you've been in a relationship with someone that is partially in the closet mm -hmm. um, or if you have been that person and you take the step towards coming completely out, right. the people that you need come to you because that energy Great. releases and then a new energy fills that. Mm -hmm. right. You don't come out of the closet and then people are like, "Ugh, God, look at this right. weirdo that's right. totally confident in themselves. Right. Once you do that and you shed that part right. of your life, that guilt and that shame, and it takes a while. Right. It doesn't happen overnight. But a little bit, it does. You know, like once you go like, oh, this is who I am. It's a power that you can't even imagine until you get it. Right. Um, and I think that that is something that this gal needs to, you know, think about. I'm so glad that you said that, Rhea, because I think that is also something to just really be strong about in saying that, mm -hmm. you know, I am closer to now to my family than I've ever been. Mm -hmm. um, I'm closer now to my straight friends. Right. And the grief was my own. Cheryl and I talk about this all the time, that people need to be close to themselves. They need to be truthful about who they are. And the world picks up on that. That's what's sexy in the universe, is people who know themselves mm -hmm. and are openly a mess mm -hmm. and openly in a state of struggle. And that's destabilizing. But for this woman, I have this feeling of like, this bright path awaits you. There is somebody who's going to be proud to be with you, not just hide on an island with you, but who's proud to be with you. And it's clear to me that she wants to have a bigger life and that that life involves taking this step into real honesty with who she is. And it's like, hey, embrace that. It's scary, but it's also the most exciting moment. It's all before her. You know, you have to surround yourself with people who see your greatness and who want for you greatness. And this woman clearly is on the brink of realizing that, but I think she's being held back by somebody who, for whatever reasons, is holding herself back from knowing herself, from admitting who she is and embracing who she is. And that's a, that's a very sad thing to leave behind, but it's also part of how you grow up. It's a disruptive process.
My favorite writer is Alice Munro. And whenever I contemplate a moment like this in, in my own life or in someone else's life, I think of this great short story she wrote. And it's about um, this young woman. She's a teenager and she joins this church and falls in love with this guy who is like at this kind of teenage Sunday school class. And um, so she hot. loses her virginity. <laughs> <laughs> she loses her virginity to him and falls in love with him. And he ends up being somebody who treats her badly and is trying to kind of make her smaller. She's this very ambitious, smart mm -hmm. young woman who's going to go off and do big things in her life. But she's still at that age that she isn't, she's not sure she really will. You know, she has all this promise, but none of it is realized. And by the end of the, the story in which she loses her virginity, they have this fight and she breaks up with him. And she's, she's sad, but the story ends in this beautiful phrase that always comes to mind. And his name is Garnet French. And Alice Munro just writes, Garnet French, Garnet French, Garnet French, real life. And I think about 